This past August, the World Economic Forum released a report arguing that blockchain technology will become the beating heart of the global financial system. What is it and how far-reaching might its effects be? Let's ask. Don Tapscott, author and digital strategist, and his son, Alex Tapscott, who together have authored the new book, Blockchain Revolution, how the technology behind Bitcoin is changing money, business, and the world. And we welcome this dynamic father-son combo back here to TVO. Good to have you. You've been here before. I nice have. to meet you for the first time. Nice to meet you, too. I, we mentioned the World Economic Forum off the top here. I want to quote a little passage from their report on the future of financial infrastructure, and then we'll chat. Here we go. Sheldon, please. Blockchain could redraw the structure of financial institutions and the back end of services as we know them today. Blockchain could allow consumers to pay less for all kinds of financial activity, from international payments to the trading of stocks and bonds. It could also give regulators new capabilities, allowing them to stop regulatory violations before they start and to watch more effectively for warning signs of financial crises. Okay, that all sounds pretty impressive, but first of all, we gotta find out what this all is. So, Don, <coughs> blockchain technology is what? Well, it's kind of interesting you went to the World Economic Forum, because Alex was just there for a there. He I flew, was, flew yeah. in last night, and I'm also an, an advisor to the forum, and we're very much involved in their initiatives. Um, l let me wind back a, a little bit. We've had the Internet of Information for decades. And when I send you some information, I'm actually sending you a copy. I keep the original, the PDF or the email or even a website, and that's great. But when it comes to the things that make the economy work, assets, things of value like money and stocks and bonds and intellectual property and even art and music and votes and, and uh, energy and, and our identities and, and so on, sending a copy is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. If I send you $100, it's really important I don't still have the money <laughs> and I can't send it to Alex because I owe him 100 um, <laughs> or, or to somebody else. And uh, this has been called the double spend problem for a long time. And the way that we manage this in our economy is through big intermediaries. Now, for the first time ever, we have a global distributed ledger where anything of value from money to votes to music can be stored, managed, and exchanged peer to peer without a powerful intermediary. Play that forward. How does that actually work? Well, I think what Don's describing is an evolution, basically, from an internet of information to an internet of value. And what's really fascinating about this second generation of the internet is that it's likely to have, if not as great, perhaps an even greater impact on the world of business and on our institutions. So you point out financial services, and uh, that's an area where a lot of uh, people who've been writing and talking about this have pointed to first. And to be sure, the industry will be transformed, fundamentally. I'd say it would be practically unrecognizable in five years. But financial services is just the start. Uh, other industries, like creative industries, uh, music, film, art, journalism, could also be transformed. Uh, let's take music as an example. So in the music industry today, artists don't really get that great of a deal. In fact, some look back at the 50s and 60s as the golden age, which is pretty sad because back then they also got a terrible deal. Uh, today, though, if an artist has a song and it plays on Spotify, and it gets a million streams, um, they're not making as much money as they did in the old days. In the old days, if a song was purchased a million times, they'd make $45,000 if they were the writer on that song. Today, they would make $36. Period, full stop. Period, full stop. <laughs> so that's an unsustainable model, and it's one where the creators of content are just not getting fairly compensated for the value that they create. And that's problematic because it could imperil the entire music industry. So what does blockchain have to do with that? Well, there are companies today that are working with this technology to program intelligence into music. You know, music is already digital, but it's always been treated as information. And the internet has basically pushed it through this printing press that's made it a free commodity. With blockchain, we can take music and turn it back into a digital asset. Every time a song is consumed, it will trigger what's called a smart contract which is basically what it sounds like. It's uh, programming language that mimics the logic of a contract with guaranteed execution, enforcement, and payments. So you want to play that song on the radio, you want to stream it, you want to buy it, you want to sample it for a movie or a TV show, you want to use the drum track for another piece of music. That will trigger a contract which will ensure that a payment goes directly to the creator of content. All automatic. All automatically. So today what happens is artists get paid last, if they get paid at all. They're usually the 10th in line after financial intermediaries, labels, performing rights organizations, and a whole bunch of other um, third parties who get paid first. 
and sometimes they miss getting paid, period. Mm -hmm. So this would basically turn that paradigm on its head, where artists would get fed first and they get fed fairly, and then they would decide mm -hmm. whether or not all those other groups actually added value. So we don't have to trust anybody anymore to make this happen, right? It's all, it's all going to be peer-to-peer -peer in the future. Is that right? Well, trust is actually built into the platform. Today, to, to do all this business in the economy, we have to count on big banks, governments, credit card companies, big social media companies. And they enable us to trust each other. They identify who we are. Um, they uh, do the clearing and settling of transactions. They keep records. And overall, they enable us to work together. But with this new blockchain, a global distributed ledger, we can all do these transactions. And trust is not established by big institutions. It's established by, by cryptography, by collaboration, and by some very clever code. So that's why we call it the trust protocol, because trust is is generic, it's, it's, it's part of the platform. Let's pick up on the financial services angle that mm -hmm. you just mentioned. You know, I'm trying to, the, the implications of this are absolutely astonishing because right now, the city that we're sitting in right now, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, its financial district with all of those skyscrapers depends very heavily, not on the scenario you've described in this book, but right. on the status quo. Right. What in heaven's name is going to happen when we don't need them to do 95% of the things that we now do today? This is the million dollar question. And it's uh, div divided the financial services industry into a few different camps and how they think about this technology. There are some who don't really understand it, but understand it enough to know that it will be disruptive. And because they're not really a a fully aware of its capability, they're afraid. They're scared of what it might mean for their businesses and they feel entrenched. And I had a firsthand experience of this when I was in Dubai at the World Economic Forum event where someone from a, a, to be named a, an unnamed um, money transfer company told me that um, this was all not going to happen the way that I was suggesting. Those people are a minority. Increasingly more financial services firms fit into bucket number two. They're looking at it opportunistically. You know, they see, like we do, an opportunity to disintermediate third parties that they rely on, mm -hmm. which could cut cost for their business. It could reduce risk, like counterparty risk, um, the risk that your trading partner doesn't have the capital to fulfill a trade, and that can be a big source of concern for financial institutions, and can, generally speaking, increase the speed and functionality of the industry. And so they see it opportunistically uh, as a way to cut costs, save money. And that's a fair way of looking at it, and it's a way that I think is very bank-like. And it's one where in this current environment where growth is declining, the regulatory burden of doing business is increasing, where um, fintech companies, you know, new technology mm -hmm. firms are competing with them in every single market. It's a very rational way of thinking, but it's the wrong way of thinking. Well, as you point out, I think I, I, I don't think I know. I read it in your book. Towers, Tower Records was not the company that invented the iPod. <laughs> uh, right? So it's probably not going to be the major banks today that develop whatever this new system to come well, is going to be? Well, all of the incumbents, the big banks, have this problem of paradigms that when you get a whole new paradigm, the leaders of the old uh, often find great difficulty embracing the new. And it's been thus throughout history. But they should. They should get all over this and understand that the world is changing. You think about it, like if you tap your card in Starbucks, what happens is a bunch of messages go through eight, ten different companies, some of them using mainframes from the 1970s, and three days later a settlement occurs. Well, if the banks were to move to a blockchain infrastructure for all finance, um, then there would be no three-day settlement because the payment and the settlement is the same activity. But Don, you said it in the book, and I think I, I, think I have another simile coming to mind right now, which is not, not simile, but another analogy. Blockbuster didn't create Netflix. You yeah. know, are these guys capable of doing this kind of forward well, thinking? Well, we're more hopeful for the Canadian banks. Uh, they're, they're banks that are uh, big. There are not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're relatively stable. They, they have a good regulatory environment. And in each of these banks today, there are innovators trying to think how financial services could be uh, could be very different. But as Alex was saying, they need to think strategically, mm -hmm. not just about saving money. Like NASDAQ, for example, at our book launch in New York, it was on Wall Street, 
and it was hosted by NASDAQ. And at the end, they said, you're probably wondering why we're here hosting this, because stock markets can go away, right. as we can do trades peer to peer. And they said, but we're not a stock market company, we're a technology company, and we're really good at making markets. So they showed on the stage a demonstration of a new NASDAQ delivered electrical power grid where sun shines on a solar panel, electricity is sold back into the power grid in a peer-to-peer -peer rate, not you know to Ontario Hydro at, uh, at wholesale rates. So that motivates all of us to use solar. And then we watched on the stage as digital money came into the computer of the guy who had this solar panel. Hmm. So this is a company thinking strategically. I want to pick up on that example, and I can't remember that you're going to remind me of the, the place in the book where this took place. Sure. Um, Electricity generation pulls mm -hmm. all over the place. Yeah. One of them falls down in the middle of nowhere, some remote location. It takes three guys to get somebody out there to find the pole, fix the pole. In the meantime, all of these people. Was it New Zealand? Is that what no, the answer Australia. Australia. Yeah, Australia. Okay. Australia. Yeah. That's, pretty, that's pretty close. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Smart poles. Yeah. Right? Th this is the future. This is what you're trying to figure out where a pole can automatically identify or send a message to somebody. I'm down. Help fix me. This family doesn't have to go three days without power. That's absolutely right. That example is um, one of many in what's called the Internet of Things. So we hear about this expression from time to time, basically describing a world where there will be hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of Internet-enabled devices doing everything from driving us around to managing our affairs to monitoring our health to uh, generating our electricity. These different devices, from smart poles to smart watches, need a way to communicate value to each other in, in a sense that is secure, private and frictionless. So you can imagine an example where there's a light bulb in your house and it's generating electricity through NASDAQ smart grid from your neighbor's solar panel. And it's um, metering that out at say a penny a day. Hmm. That's not going through the Visa network because Visa's minimum interchange fee is 30 cents. So you're not gonna put a 30 cent fee on a one cent payment. So we need a new native digital medium to move value between different devices. And we need a way to do it securely. Uh, you may recall a few weeks ago the US internet was down for about a day. That happened because hackers attacked cheap internet enabled devices like baby monitors and through a distributed denial of service attack were able to take down the internet. Those devices need a way to secure data and to move data and to move value um, without risk of it being attacked. Yeah, for example that light bulb is going to pay the power source and the light bulb using a blockchain will have a reputation and the NASDAQ power source will sell it light because it knows that it's a light bulb that always pays its bills. Hmm. So the internet of everything needs a ledger of everything to manage all hmm. this. I get that, but pick up on Alex's angle of confidentiality, privacy, security. Convince us that this is going to protect all of those well, the, things. The, this is one of the biggest arguments to move towards a blockchain world, that these new platforms are much more secure. To make a very long story short, if a block is just typically, say, a 10-minute period of time where all the transactions are captured, who bought who, what, who paid for who, who bought what house, who married who, who voted, could be anything. And then there's a, a, a group of, they're called miners, not young people, like uh, uh, gold miners. Mm -hmm. And they own massive computing resources, 10 to 100 times bigger than all of Google's servers in the world. And they compete to find out the truth every 10 minutes. And whoever wins gets some of the digital currency from that blockchain. So if I wanted to go and hack a block and pay you the 100 and pay it also to Alex, I'd have to hack that block, not just on one computer, but across millions of computers all around the world. And it's a chain. So each block is connected to the previous block. I'd have mm -hmm. to hack the entire history of commerce on that blockchain, all in the light of the most powerful computing resource in the world that's watching me to make sure I don't mess around. So theoretically, it should be more secure. Well, it's infinitely more infinitely, secure than yeah. the systems that we have today. Mm -hmm. Now, we won't say it's unhackable. Just shy of unhackable. Yeah, just shy, just of. <laughs> shy of unhackable. That's a good expression. If it, if it gets hacked, or sorry, if we say it's unhackable on this show yeah. tomorrow morning, it'll get hacked. It'll get hacked, <laughs> yes. So you don't want to say that. Alex, I know that uh, one of the things you say in the book is that you hope this revolution will bring a flatter Earth, will bring a more democratic, a, yeah. a more equitable society for all. But I don't have to tell either of you guys that we just saw an election in the United States where 
a lot of people, maybe 60 million, mm -hmm. voted in a certain way because they are terrified about the pace of change, about globalization, about things happening too fast that they can't control or understand. And I'll tell you something, I had a lot of sympathy for them having read your book because a lot of this stuff is very hard to, I mean, you're explaining it very well, but it's very hard to grasp. And it's, you know, it's the future and it's moving very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. How is this going to make the world actually flatter, more democratic, more equitable, and not just increase the disparity that too many people in this world are already feeling? Well, um, we don't fail to see the irony in suggesting that this technology could create a more fair and prosperous world when previous technologies have done basically the, the opposite. opposite. Uh, but we think this time it's different. This um, technology has the potential to solve what we call in the book the prosperity paradox. This problem that wealth is being created, but prosperity is not increasing, meaning that the rising tide of technology is no longer lifting all boats in the way it may have before in the past. Um, but whereas the internet was about information, this is about value. And essentially, it could solve a lot of big problems. For example, there are two and a half billion people in the world who don't have access to basic financial services. They don't have a way to store money that's not in, say, an animal that they own. They don't have a way to move money that isn't through egregiously priced money transfer services. And so they're basically captured, and their wealth is captured in a gray economy, an economy that's not connected to the world. So even though globalization has created a lot of wealth, they haven't participated in that. Now, with blockchain, you can radically lower the barriers for financial inclusion, where the nuts and bolts of retail banking, savings, payments, and access to credit can be widely available to all. Perhaps an even bigger problem, though, is the issue of land titling. In the developing world, 70% of people who think that they own property actually have an unenforceable claim to that property, meaning that there could be an incomplete record in a government office, there could be a competing claim, um, that someone else has because the records are just plain shoddy. Or they may think they own it, but they have no claim at all. And it turns out that property ownership is basically a precondition for any kind of upward mobility, period, full mm -hmm. stop. It's not only the roof over your head, it is um, a way to generate income, it is a source of credit if you want to start a business or pay for an education, it is literally the lifeblood of so many people's personal finances. So if we had um, personal property records living on a distributed ledger, everyone would know for sure who owned what. And it would also mean that a, either a corrupt dictator or just a corrupt local official in the neighborhood you know, government office couldn't unilaterally change a record without it tr being immediately spotted and fixed by a network of um, millions of eyeballs who are making mm -hmm. sure that integrity is coded into the system. Let me pursue that with your dad a bit because... Sure. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. You, you've been so studious well, not to call him. he is my son. He is your son, but you've been so careful not to call him dad once in this whole interview, and I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done That's that. That's all right. Him. He has the ability to um, take up where I left off and vice versa, because we actually share a brain. <laughs> you share a lot more than that. Um, okay, where did I want to go now? Uh, I remember when somebody tried to take over Bitcoin, right? Somebody tried to own it all. Somebody tried to corner the market on Bitcoin. And what's to stop anybody from, from doing that here? Can somebody take it over? Uh, in theory, yes. Mm -hmm. But to do that, you'd have to develop a computing capability that's significantly bigger than the existing miner community, mm -hmm. which is 10 to 100 times bigger than all of Google's servers in the world. Mm -hmm. So good luck doing that. And why would you do it? If you took it over, then it would be worth nothing. So well, unless, unless you were the gatekeeper and then you can charge anybody anything. No, 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 you can't. If you no? take it over, then the value of the entire network goes to zero because the, the trust has been destroyed hmm. and people can't count on each other to do transactions. It would, it would actually become worth nothing. So it really yeah. does depend yeah. on the face of it in the, being the, as democratic as possible. The only scenario that you could possibly imagine would be like ISIS gets state power somewhere in a significant country, mm -hmm. and they decide to use massive resources of the state to try and just bring this thing down, just to disrupt things. But the, in the book, there are a lot of these interesting problems that we talk about, mm -hmm. and we put them all in one of two categories. This is a reason why this is a bad idea. 
or is this an implementation challenge and something that we need to manage? Right. And the benefits so far outweigh the downside that they all ended up in bucket number two. But, you know, the future, it's, it's not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And we all need to get involved in this stuff and make sure that this uh, smaller world that our kids inherit might actually be a better one. Uh, the Tapscott boys have done it again. It's great to have you two here. Nice to meet you. We've had him My here pleasure. before, but nice to meet you. Blockchain revolution, how the technology behind Bitcoin is changing money, business, and the world. And we think we've sort of let you in on some of that during this conversation. Don and Alex, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you very Our much. Pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.